place in our hearts, in our being. It's not in our heart. It's like not here or here or here or here or there. Where it's okay. Where everything's fine. Where it's all right. Where there's a, a core of a feeling of well-being. It's okay. Right now. Not later. Not when your hair looks better. right now and we've lost that connection to that place so we're everything we do is we're trying to find that feeling but it's not out there it's not in anything you can get or hold on to or let go of it's who we are but maybe you notice we think a lot have you noticed that no? Oh, okay. Let me say something else then. I wonder what the Giants won today. What do you think? Or your Jets fan? Who's it? Never mind. They both suck. <laughs> Give them some time. And then when they win, I'll be all right. But what if they play each other like today? Will I be all right or not all right? You know... There's never going to be a time when you, you get it all up here. You're ne we're never going to figure it out. It's not figure outable. Finally, you just stop trying to figure it out. And you get tired of trying to make it all right. And then, guess what? Then you notice that it's all right. But, you know, you have to be really obsessively crazy out of your mind trying to make it all right for a long time, which most of us qualify for. And, you know, I'm not making this up. This is what I experienced directly when I was with these great beings in India. They weren't trying to make it all right. It was just all right. As we are. That's really hard because nobody told us that, you know. Not our parents, not our teachers, not our friends. Nobody told us it was all right. One time I was sitting in the back of the temple with Siddhima, who was Maharaji's great disciple. And uh, the eldest son, no, the eldest grandson of a, a family, the Tiwari family, very close family of devotees of Maharaji. The eldest grandson was getting married. He was the first one of the generation to get married. So all the cousins and brothers and cousin brothers and cousin sisters and sister cousins, if you know India. Some of them don't even know each other. They all came to get blessings for the marriage. And I was sitting back there and all like 15 or 20 of these younger people were there. And I was just sitting there and I was watching them. There was so much love and affection between these relatives. I don't know about you. <laughs> Need I talk about my relatives? <laughs> Anyhow, and I was astounded. I mean, I just, I was just like, I couldn't believe how much sweetness and joy there was with these kids. And Siddhima saw me, and she said, See, Krishna Das, you see? You see what you missed by being born in America. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? <laughs> I mean, really, you know? All of Western culture is basically dedicated to fucking us up. <laughs> That's what it's here for. And we are doing that. Our, all of us collectively, all of our karmas, that's we, this is what we created. The world we create every day over and over. 
dedicated to keeping us asleep and, and unhappy and unfulfilled. Because we've been trained and we've been taught to believe that we're going to find that thing outside of ourselves, whatever shape or form it is, animate or inanimate, a real person or whether it runs on batteries. We'll find it and it'll make it all right. <laughs> Gonna be a fun day. <laughs> and it never makes it all right. It gives us a little pleasure, which releases a little tension, and that's nice, but that passes, right? Pleasure and happiness are two different things. If you have pleasure, there's always an opposite of pain. Either the pleasure and experience goes away, or a painful experience goes away and then becomes pleasurable. So if the pleasurable experience goes away, then there's dissatisfaction. It's called the pairs of opposites. And if you look at life, you can see that. There's always, if there's fame, there's always shame. If there's loss, there's always gain. There's always two things like that. But happiness, uh -uh, happiness is, and that feeling of okayness lives inside of us already. Might be in here. <laughs> Let me see. Is this going to give me eternal okayness? Depends on how high a dose it is. Nice. Temporary pleasure. So, yeah. So, then you be, then, you know, if you're doing some spiritual, so called spiritual practice, look at your motivation. Why are you doing it? And one time I was living in San Francisco and I, I had this little closet, and there's a house with other people. I had a big closet where I could go in and sit down and meditate, and I wouldn't be bothered by anybody. So I went in, closed the door, lit the candle, lit the incense, and then I sat down. Before my ass hit the cushion, I went, oh, shit. Because I saw my motivation for meditating, I, I recognized it was to create a me that I could like. Right? Somebody I wouldn't give such a hard time to, like I do all the time, to myself. So then I said, shit, and I left the closet. Now, if I'd stayed in that closet, <laughs> but I didn't. But I saw my motivation was self-hatred. So what can come from self-hatred? Just more nonsense. So when we sit, when we sing, when we do asana, when we do any kind of whatever spiritual practice means to you, don't try too hard. Be with it, you know, just be with it. You're not going to be able to take your mind and hold it on one thought. That ain't going to happen. Not living in New York City or anywhere else on this planet. Very difficult to do that. It takes a lot of serious effort and to concentrate the mind that way. And it takes a lot of will power. And it's probably beyond most of us to do that. It's certainly beyond me to do that. But when I sit, or when I sing, I can notice when I'm it allows me to notice when I'm gone. And then I just come back. Then I'm actually already back. So you're sitting, or you're singing, and you wonder if you set the, uh, the recorder to get the, the Giants game so you can watch it when you get home. <laughs> Shit, did I do that? I don't know, man, I'm so stupid, I couldn't do that. Oh, <laughs> That's what it's like. And that's what it's going to be like. You want, there's no button to find that's going to make that go away. Little by little, actually, we can calm our asses down. But it takes some regular intention and some regular practice to do that. 
And uh, we're really busy, all of us. We have busy lives full of all kinds of stuff. So much input from so many directions. So the cards are stacked against us in terms of finding any kind of peace of mind. But that's just the way it is. That's this world at this time. That doesn't mean we can't find it, but it means one has to start paying attention. One has to start looking at oneself and trying to figure out what you want, what we want. What do we really want? And on one hand, in some way, finding out what we really want is our spiritual practice. It's not just when we sit down to meditate or, or calm ourselves down or do some asana or whatever we do. That's part of it. That's a method. Why do we do those methods? So we can have a good life. And so we can have the, the strength to become a good human being. I'm sorry. Didn't anybody tell you you were human beings? That's what this is about. What, are you trying to become a good Martian? You're not from Mars. Human. Earth. That's it. That's the deal. Are you going to go somewhere else? Where? How? Oh, you think you're going to go to some nice blissful heaven world? Forget about it. It doesn't last either. The only thing that lasts is what and who we really are. And that's already here. That's inside of us. That's looking out of our eyes right now. We don't see what's looking out of our eyes. We only see what we see. We don't see the consciousness, the being, the awareness that is doing the seeing. We're, we, we're surging out of our senses towards objects and all we see are the objects, the stuff. And our thoughts are stuff too. We don't see who we are. So as we do these practices, as we start to overcome some of our <sighs> crazy neurotic programs, we start to calm down a little bit and we stop giving ourselves such a hard time. If we weren't giving ourselves such a hard time, like if I wasn't having the thought, Krishna, you're such a piece of shit, you can't do anything. If I wasn't having that thought, where would that thought be? In the whole universe, it wouldn't be there. So if we weren't constantly telling ourselves we're not enough, or we're too much, or we're this or we're that, those thoughts wouldn't be anywhere, and we wouldn't be a prisoner of that thought. So a practice means learning to let go of that stuff, training to let go. Now, it's not easy to just let go without, finding, without bringing in another object that you begin to orbit around. So maybe you watch your breath. You know, you're going to be breathing no matter what else you're doing, most likely. So... It's always there to watch, and it's always there to come back to. So that's a great thing. That's why it's such a fantastic practice, just being with the breath. You don't have to make yourself breathe. Okay, now, now what do I do? Oh, <sighs> now what? <laughs> oh, it just happens. So you can just be with it. You don't have to manipulate it. You don't have to do anything. It's a wonderful thing to come back to. So now you're watching your breath, and you... After 20 minutes, you notice you haven't been aware of one breath. You've been thinking about all kinds of other stuff. So you simply come back. Every time you come back, every single time you remember, they say it creates a deeper, a deeper neural pathway in the brain. It actually changes the shape of the brain. They've proven that now. And so it makes it easier on the next time, the next time you remember. Bollywood. Where's that coming from? 
outside? Oh, really nice. So anyhow, where were we? We don't know. Our minds got, you know, ripped off again. Okay, we, breath, okay, we gotta come back to the breath. Oh, time to go to work, see you later, boom. That's how it is, we don't have, you know, we have to make a little bit of time in our lives just to not do anything, not even to do meditation. We need to make a little bit of time just to slow down, just to put, you know, they used to be, they used to have standard transmissions, which are now not standard, where you push the clutch in. You gotta push that clutch in every once in a while and just let the stuff and be with it and then get busy again when you're finished. But it's gonna take regular paying attention to begin to become aware of the beauty and the love that lives within us as who we already are. It's going to take a little paying attention. Nobody can do it for you. Nobody can give you that because you already have it. There's no room for anybody else to give it to you. Some great beings can uh, temporarily point you in the right direction, but you have to take the steps. And so that's the deal. So I asked Sidima after she said that, I said, Ma, what is it with Westerners? Why can't we love? Why can't we let ourselves be loved? And she said something really, I'm going to tell you what she said. She said, well, Krishna, she says, what were your parents thinking when you were conceived? Okay, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> and then she said, what were they eating when you were conceived? You know, what was their diet, you know? Well, you know, meat eaters, of course. That seems to have some effect on the consciousness. And then she said, she said, affection was used to control you as a child. You know, when you were crying and nasty, no, they didn't want to even see you. But, you know, you had to be picked up. So you, you very quickly learned that to get the attention and the affection you needed, the way you needed it, you had, to, you had to kind of give them what they wanted. So affection became a business deal at a very early age. And it hasn't changed. We're still doing business. What do you think relationships are? Business. You give me a little bit of that, I'll give a little bit of this. Okay. You're not giving it to me? What's wrong? Oh, you have a headache. Okay. I thought it was me. Okay. I was about to go jump off the cliff. But you have a headache. I understand. See, we can't navigate this shit. It's just too difficult. So relationships are business. So once I was very in love with, with someone, I don't know. I was with my Indian father, Mr. Tiwari, who was a great yogi. I mean, he was totally in the world. He was the headmaster of a big school. He had a large family. But he'd been with Maharaji for 40 years, and he was just amazing. So I was telling him how much I loved this woman, and he was going, ha, ha, TK, TK, TK. When I finally finished, he said, my boy. <laughs> he said, relationships are the business. Said, do your business, enjoy. He actually told me, do my business. Yeah! <laughs> Somebody finally telling me I could be stupid, giving me permission to be stupid. How great. Do your business, enjoy. He said, but love? He said, love lasts 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We don't get it from somebody. We don't give love. Where is it that you give it? You can give affection, kindness, caring. But love is who we are. Love is in there. 
as we are. But we've covered it up. We're so busy we can't look. We don't know where to look or how to look. And you know, there's some confusion about the so-called spiritual path. We think we have to renounce or deny ourselves our desires. But on this lineage that I'm a part of, Hanuman, there's a, a shloka in Sanskrit that says, I don't remember the Sanskrit by now, but it says, Hanuman gives not only liberation, but allows you to satisfy the desires that are useful for you to have. It's not a renunciate path. The only thing to renounce ultimately is selfishness and self-centered seeking of pleasure and avoidance of pain. That's the only thing we have to renounce. The rest of it we need. When you're hungry, you eat. The body has lots of hungers. You have to eat. You have to have certain things. Why not? Then somebody said, who told you you can't, you know? Besides my mother. <laughs> so we got to get over that. It's okay to be a human being in a human body because that's where we are. But that doesn't mean we have to be selfish and greedy. That doesn't mean our, our fears and shame have to control us 24 hours a day. We can come out from all that. We can come through all that. But it takes a little paying attention. It takes a little practice. And it takes also really kind of getting comfortable with the idea that we're beings in progress. We're, 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 we're working on it. We're working on it. All right, well, we have uh, microphones, right? How many? One or two? One? Two? So we're going to have some questions and talking. And um, if you have something to say, you can say. Kev, what are we going to do? Have this, this monitor? Okay. Shama, would you help me move this? We're good. You want to test that out, Eric? See if check, check, check. A little more? Once check, more? check, check, check. Good, good. Check. First victim, anybody? <laughs> this side's a bunch of windows. He, right, he's gone. Right there. Eric, That's over there. Yeah. And then we'll come over there. Okay. So dark over there, I can see you. First, I would like, uh, we would like to thank you and the team and, uh, and Krishna Das for your voice and your chanting. Your uh, um, chanting echoes our house another, what, 12 months now, every day, all day. When my wife here is, she's, stop with this Om Namah Shivaya, right? Hi. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. I think all of us are thanking you for that. It's amazing. Mm. I have two questions, if I may. One... I listened to Hari Krishna, Hari Rama, uh, JJ Ram for 15 minutes, 18 minutes every day as I walk to work all day. And I'm asking myself, why do I listen to it? And what? Sorry? Why do I listen to this uh, uh, four words that you repeat yeah. over and over? I feel something. Uh -huh. I feel something very strong from these words. And I cannot explain it in English or in any language. What's actually uh, um, so powerful in these words? That's the first question. Second question, question on the Om Namah Shivaya, that it's my number one track at home. Uh, hold, on, hold on one second. Let me get this sound a little bit. I can't hear you too well. Oh, sorry. The switch is on. That's on? It is on. Can you turn it up, Kev? Or are we maxed out? 
Maybe I got deafer since last no, last night. Probably <laughs> killed that. Yeah. Can we just move it a little closer and turn it up. No, it's not. There's nothing. No. I could put my hearing aids in. Let's see if that helps. No, I'm not going to do it. Turn the volume down on that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that first one. It wasn't on? Okay, let me turn it on first. Okay, now there's a light. Talk. Who has the mic? Okay. A good? Eight. Eight. One. One. Eight. Very good. Good? You don't have control. No. You don't have control. Oh. Okay, so brighten it up. Cut the lows. That's good, yeah. Should uh, I repeat from the beginning or (laughs) Or we are good now? I hesitate to say. Yes, next question. (laughs) (laughs) So fast forward not to put everybody into misery. We are thanking you for your echoes. You did that already. Thank you. No, maybe (laughs) you didn't hear. It's okay. So first question, please. Why these repeated words are so powerful and makes me listen to it all day, every day. Huh, why? I do not understand why Shiram, Ram, and Jairam. Yeah. I uh, understand there are some Indian gods, right? Mm-hmm. And second question, if I may, you, will you remember the first? Probably not. Okay, so second, <laughs> so, so second question, please. Om Namah Shivaya, our number one track at home yeah. that I listen to and I love. Okay. And I don't understand why it's so powerful. Again, an Om Namah Shivaya, which I understood, it's equivalent to Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad, the Hebrew thing for... No? That's, Ram Das uh, said something in the not book. Om, it's not Om Namah Shema Yisrael. It's no. Om Namah Shivaya. Okay, a little so different, please. A little different, yeah. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> you're asking me why you're attracted to the, the name of God? That's yeah. a good question. I have no oh, idea. Why I can listen for 15 minutes for, to Hari Krishna, Hari Rama, J.J. Ram. Only 15 minutes? No. <laughs> and then, no, and then in, it's, wrong? A, it's on the repeat. Oh. Because it's 15 minutes track. That's what you did. I see. And then it goes back again and again and again and again. Mm-hmm. But it's a bit, uh, if somebody doesn't know us, we are like a bit, uh, I don't know, if they would say, hey, crazy, you know, the people from the street. Yeah. Don't play it as loud enough for the neighbors to hear. I do, I do, I do. They're going to come take you away. (laughs) I had a friend who wrote to me once and she said she and her husband were getting divorced. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Why? She said, well, you know, I play your music in the kitchen, in the living room, in the bathroom, in the bedrooms, (laughs) all around the house. And he doesn't like it. I said, turn it off. (laughs) They're still together. That's the marriage counseling I do. (laughs) Turn it off! So, are you really asking that question? (laughs) I mean, really, think about it for a second. Amazing, that's wonderful. Why do you want to think about it and ruin it? (laughs) Yeah. These names are called the names of God. God lives within us as who and what we really are. So when we chant these names, when we think of these names, when we repeat these names, we're invoking that place within us. That's just fine. That's okay. That is uh, the ultimate reality that lives within us. And. Uh, they, the names have the magnetism. 
they do they have a shakti and each rep repetition of a name one of these names is a seed that we plant in our own being and as time goes on those seeds grow according to whatever conditions allow them to grow and I, I've told this story many times but I'll tell it again in the 1800s there was a very great saint in India called Ramakrishna Paramhans and he described the way this practice of the repetition of the name works okay so first thing is Every repetition, every single repetition of one of these names is a seed that gets planted in us. We plant that. Second, as time goes on, these seeds grow. And he said that, uh, you know, one second. <laughs> anyway, he said these seeds grow and they get caught by the wind so to speak, and they land on the roof of an old house in the jungle. And they get stuck between the tiles on the roof of that house, right? And over time and seasons and wind and rain and whatever, those tiles begin to break down and they start getting soft. And then the seeds of the repetition of the name start to grow. And the roots start to grow. And they destroy the tiles and they destroy the roof of the house. They keep growing, and they destroy the walls of the house. Ramakrishna said that house is who we think we are. So, imagine if you didn't think you are who you think you are. Like, I had this experience once in India where I, I saw that I looked up in the sky and I saw this whirling kind of way up in the sky and I laughed. I said, ha ha, that's Krishna Dasness. <laughs> and I saw it was thoughts. And when I thought, I, I am Krishna Das, then I thought I was Krishna Das. But when I didn't, when that thought, I am Krishna Das, didn't arise in me, just here, open, at ease. And when I, was, when I did think I was Krishna Das, I acted like Krishna Das. But when I, that thought didn't arise, I was just at peace, open, very, very at ease, wonderful, feeling wonderful. And then, whoop, again. And the fun, so I noticed that even when I think I'm me, which is 122% of the time, even when I think I'm me, it doesn't affect this place of being, of openness. It doesn't affect that. So I realized it was okay to be stupid because it didn't matter. It was just me thinking. Of course, it mattered to me because I think all kinds of things about myself. And some of them hurt, some of them don't, but it didn't affect this presence, the space in which we all live, which is alive and full and very beautiful. But you can't stop your thoughts. Where are you gonna, what are you going to do? Get a gun and shoot them? Where are they? I don't know. So you, all you can do is add a practice to your life that allows you to come back again and again and again. And eventually that feeling of being back, of being present, gets deeper and deeper. And as you go through your day, you're pulled into it more easily. You, 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 you live in it more, more aware without effort. So for instance, there is a place within us that these mantras are going on all the time by themselves. And when we re remember them, we actually move ourselves into that place for a second and then of course our thoughts pull us right out. But 
we're actually here all the time, even though most of the time we don't know it. It's amazing. We go, th you know, most people get born, graduate high school, drink some beer and die, and that's it. <laughs> they were never here for a moment. Not for one moment were they, alive, were they really present and alive. They were on automatic their whole lives, one thing after the other, one reaction after the other, bouncing off of this one, bouncing off of that one, bouncing, and then <laughs> gone. So if we're interested in this stuff at all, it means that we have a longing already. We, we know we want something. We have a hunger, a longing. And that's enough, believe it or not. Without that, we have no sense of direction. So, it's really, if you want to get esoteric about it, which I'm sure he does, <laughs> is the name repeating us. You think you're doing it because you think you are who you think you are. But it's not that at all. The name is repeating itself and making you aware of it. So that's a great blessing. But we take all that stuff like, you know, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, what's on TV? Next victim. You don't okay. have to stand. I, mean, I don't have to stand, thank you. You, you told me I did. No. I didn't want to stand. <laughs> yeah, this is not Sunday school. Um, so Wait a minute, it is. <laughs> this is Sunday. Get up. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so what you just said, I think, leads into my question. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for introducing me to the Hanuman Chalisa, because that is so meaningful to mm -hmm. me. And um, I heard you say once uh -oh. that... <laughs> I know, uh-oh, right? Um, I heard you say once that we say the Hanuman Chalisa not for ourselves, but to remind Hanuman who he is. So can you, can you explain that to me? What do you mean by that? Uh, no, I can't. I have no idea what that means. Uh, one time I was coming back. I was in the temple in India, and I, uh, I was getting ready to leave for America. And this really, really old devotee, Papa, we called him Papa, he called me. I went to say goodbye to him. So I was in his room with him, and he said, um, he said, uh, so do you do Hanuman Chalisa? And I said, yeah, sure. He said, why? Uh, I don't know. He said, we, 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 we do Hanuman Chalisa to remind Hanuman of his, of his strength and to ask him to come and help us. So in the story of the Ramayana, which is where Hanuman comes from, that story, Hanuman is actually a form of Shiva believe it or not. And Shiva emanated, sent his energy through the wind god. I know you all believe in the wind god. See, when you talk about this shit, it's completely nuts because nobody knows what the fuck we're talking about. But we all sit there like, oh, wow, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm included. I don't know who the fuck any of these people are. <laughs> wind god, whoa. I love when people really talk like they know what they're saying, you know? <laughs> oh yes, then the son of the wind. Yeah, well, who's that? The son of the wind, okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, so in the story, um, Rama, Vishnu, is going to take an avatar form on the earth to destroy the demons, the negativity. So Shiva hears about this. He probably saw it on uh, Facebook. <laughs> and he decided he couldn't incarnate himself, so he'd send his energy through the wind god. The wind god came and impregnated Anjani, who was a, a, a vanar, which is like a half monkey, half human. And so Hanuman was born pretty much immediately and he carried that energy of, of Shiva. So he had unlimited powers. 
Now, can you imagine a baby with unlimited powers? Right. Throwing your mother up and juggling your father and mother like this. You know, I mean, he, had, he could do anything. So one of the things, he, since he was innately spiritual, he used to love to go to the jungle with the rishis, where the rishis were doing their, their ceremonies. And he loved them so much, he would like, you know, throw them up and down and, and play with them. And they couldn't do anything because he had ultimate power. He could do anything as a baby. So they cursed him that he would only remember his power when he was reminded. So right after that, he became a good little boy. And so when we do the chalisa, when we sing the chalisa, we're, we're attempting to activate that kind of inner strength that can overcome any obstacle. Because Hanuman is called Sankata Mochan, Sankata Harana, Karuna Sagar, Ocean of Compassion, Destroyer of Suffering, Remover of Calamities. This is what he did. This is what it is. Now, look, do I know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Yeah, that's why I get the big bucks. But intuitively, I feel it. Up here, it makes no sense at all, obviously. Flying monkeys, what is this shit? But in here, having been in India and having the blessings to be with some very, very, very great saints and wonderful people who really completely immersed in this understanding of the spiritual path, this particular path. I kind of caught it like a bad cold or something like that. So, and of course being with Maharaji, who we saw him as Hanuman himself. I don't even know how to explain that to you. Except that when we're with him and when we think of him, when we are with him, even inside of ourselves, there's a, a depth of feeling and a depth of um, presence that changes the perspective on what's going on in the outside world. And the results of that shift in, in, in uh, perception is that everything looks different. Everything, things that are negative aren't necessarily aimed at me and things that are positive don't necessarily make me stupidly happy. But it, it's a way of being in the world without being completely reactive to the stuff that happens every day. There's a, there's a, a, a presence or a, a space around it all. Just like this room, right? Each one of us are in our own little bubble. There's a physical bubble, there's a mental bubble, an emotional bubble. We're all like in that bubble. And we're sitting next to all these other bubbles. But if you, if you just kind of move back this way a little bit, you see all of these bubbles are held in this space, even of this room, okay? And then you think, okay, well, this building is even held in the space of the sky. And inside of the sky, everything in the space, ether in this space. Everything exists inside of this space. So, it just loosens up the knots in our hearts. What did you ask me? <laughs> Wait, there he is out there. He's roaring out there. Yeah. That's Hanuman farting. <laughs> He's big. Oh boy. Is it, so anyhow, that's the deal. You know, there's a macrocosm and a microcosm. There's the, the stories we could think, oh yeah, maybe this happened or maybe it's just mythology. 
but actually within us, the same forces exist. The same energies exist within us. And Ayurveda is all about that inner universe, which mirrors the external universe as well. So there's, a, there's, there's some way of understanding all this stuff. But, so you can say Hanuman gives us the strength to overcome obstacles, but where is that strength? It's already within us. So it's an idea of, of uh, opening up to that within us, which we don't really feel most of the time. We feel pretty much um, imprisoned by our stuff. So that's why we do these practices. Ganesha is very similar to Hanuman in that way, remover of obstacles. But that's mostly in South India. He, since I'm from the north, Hanuman's a lot in the north. Anybody? Oh, all the way over here. Oh, there's somebody there. Go there and then come here. It's coming. You've uh, d described to us what it was like to, for you and your devotees to be in the presence of Maharaji. If you could just maybe let us have some insight into what was um, your sense of Maharaji's did he understand the depth of uh, the effect he was having on his devotees? He knew everything, you know, everything. Who's that? Where, where's this question from? Okay. Yeah, no, he, he knew everything. Past, present, future. He knew everything you were thinking, everything you were feeling. It was hard to get used to. Living in the presence of somebody who knew everything about you, every miserable thought, thing you've ever done, and he loved you more than you could ever even imagine loving yourself or be loving by anybody. That was really intense. And when we could open to it, it was fantastic. But the other times, we just couldn't bear it. It's like trying to look at the sun, you know, we're just like, whoa, you know. It was interesting, opening, closing, opening, closing, and then he would look at us and giggle and we'd be open again, you know, because he didn't care about our stuff at all, not at all. He literally didn't judge us. He knew everything, but he didn't judge. So he just loved you? He, well, no, he didn't just love us. He loved us more than, loves us more than anything because, okay, and he also was a siddha, is a siddha. A siddha is a being that has the ability to change the situation from the inside. He can ripen your karmas. He can change the way your life is going to unfold. And he did that for everybody that he, who, with whom he had work to do. And I have no idea how many people that was could have been millions and millions of people. You know, we were sitting with him, and I was sitting with him, and like, I was looking, and he went like this. So he's talking to people, and then all of a sudden he goes, like this. And he saw me looking, and he went, he said, the mind can go a million miles in the blink of an eye. He just went, and I realized he had just gone somewhere and come back. It's very extraordinary. You have more? Where's the mic? Give him the mic. He's not finished. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Good. It, it's. I mean, the closest we get to this stuff is kind of science fiction and comic books. You know, it's just like we don't grow up with 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 the capacity almost to feel. Something, it's like, how many colors are there? Red, orange, green, blue, Roy G. Biv, I learned that in high school. Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. Seven colors, am I right? Well, it's like there's an eighth color that's visible to those who can see it. But our eyes, our senses, only conceive, only can see those seven colors and every combination of that. But there's an eighth color that's here all the time, but we don't see it. And that's interesting. 
because we don't see it, so we don't believe it. And you should not believe anything you don't experience yourself, by the way. Just because we're talking about this stuff, don't think you need to believe it. It's not important. We need to believe ourselves and in ourselves, and we need to deal with our lives as they are. Not to fantasize that there's some other way of being. We have to deal with our shit as it is and learn to let go of it and learn to accept ourselves for who we are as we are and allow ourselves to breathe and really breathe and just be in this world. It's not necessary to believe any of this stuff about India or any of this stuff. It's not necessary. I've been in India more than half my more than half my Jesus. Five sevenths of my life. And I can't I don't I don't necessarily believe that that stone sculpture in, in, in a temple is alive and real, but they do. You know, and nobody ever required me to believe that. Maharaji didn't make us. He loved us, loves us as we are. He didn't make us Hindus. He didn't make us this or that. He, he helped us become human. That's amazing. Human, with other humans. Wow. People everywhere. And it's okay. When we asked him, how do we find God? He said, serve people. What? You know, what? I want to, you know, what about, how do you raise Kundalini, you know? <laughs> he said, feed people. Feed people? What is he talking about? We looked at, what is this? We just weren't, we couldn't handle it. It was too subtle. He was telling us not to think about ourselves all the time. Think about others. If we don't think about ourselves, we won't be unhappy. Because we won't be thinking about ourselves. <laughs> how simple is that? But how hard is it not to think about ourselves, right? It takes practice. So he said, serve people, feed people, and remember God. Repeat the names of God. He was very big on that. And he said over and over again, Ram Nam Karne Se Sab Pura Ho Jate Hai. From going on repeating these names of God, everything is accomplished. He said it. Do I believe it? Okay, maybe 5%. Maybe after 50 years. So it's not easy, but that's what he said. From remembering these names, from repeating these names, everything is accomplished. Everything is brought to fullness and completion. Period. Amen. That's the deal. Okay, let's get with the program. Well, I think I want to watch the Giants game. It's not so easy. Our, the vasanas of our, of, our, of our mind and our own karmas keep propelling us into limited, programmed, reactive ways of thinking and being in the world every day. We just can't stop the flow. There's no button to push. Nowhere. So we have to do something. We have to start paying a little bit of attention, add a little bit of practice into our daily lives. Start trying to figure out what it is we want. How do we want to feel? What do we want to do? When I started singing with people, nobody else was doing this, really, the way this is. Uh, so I had nobody to, to follow or to ask, how do you do this? I had to listen to my heart. I had to do what I wanted to do. That's what I'm still doing. I actually, I can't believe I can actually live, I can do what I like to do in my life most of the time. How amazing is that? That's not, you know, I grew up on Long Island. What were the odds of that happening? <laughs> right? Not much. So. It's extraordinary. So everybody has to find that. And you, you do it right where you are. As your life is right this moment, everything in our lives is there. This is our karmic predicament at this moment. Now what? So there's no eraser. There's no spray eraser. You can do like this one. Erase them from our life. Now that one. No, we have to find a way to deal with this stuff and still 
learn to listen to our own hearts as what's good for us, what we need to do. Sometimes we have to do what we have to do, and then you're doing what you want to do because taking care of business is good. And there's all kinds of business in our lives. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah? Oh, okay. Thank you. Hi. You're on. Good. Um, thank you. I, I too want to thank you for um, all that you do, you, Nina, and everyone, all that you do in giving us. I want to thank you. Okay. I would like to know in your experience, understanding that Hanumanji is immortal. Mm -hmm. If you have ever experienced in your relationship with the Chalisa that he has physically come to sit by you in your chanting over your 50 years. Uh, first of all, about immortal, I don't even know what it's like to be alive temporarily. So immortal is kind of out of the question. I have no idea what that means. However, as far as Hanumanji coming and sit by me, that would mean that I don't see him that way. I don't feel about it. I feel a presence. I, and I want to enter into that presence of love when I sing. That's my guru for me. He doesn't come like a person or a thing as far as I can tell. That's not the way I see it. Some people do see those things. They're open in different ways. I, I totally honor that. It's just not my, my, my deal. But when I sing, I feel it. That's why I sing. Because the rest of the day sucks. <laughs> the only time I'm really happy these days is when I'm singing. You know? uh, but I, you would think I sang more, but I don't. Like, I'm sure you, you know, you might think, wow, Krishnadas, he gets up in the morning, he takes a cold shower. <laughs> then he eats some vegetables. <laughs> then he puts on his dhoti and his holy clothes, and he sits by the harmonium and goes into bliss. <laughs> it's a nice fantasy, maybe someday. Probably not this life. Well, I'm doing the best I can. That's all I can do. What else am I going to do? I try not to give myself too hard a time. Uh, but I'm not sure how successful I am most of the time. Okay? Boy, I'm really good at avoiding questions today. <laughs> Who's got the thing? Hi. Hi. Uh, two quick things. They may be slightly. Hold my camera. They might be slightly different than my colleagues here. But um, first of all, did you remember to record the Yukon women's game before you? I did. Okay. Good man. Good man. Um, secondly, it means a lot to all of us that come here and have practiced in this space with Dharma mm -hmm. to have you here as the closing act, as it were. Oh yeah, um, it's next week. It's they're moving yeah. out of here. So thank you Let's very much. Stay. For... We won't let him move us. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you very selfishly, as someone who subscribes to the Sirius uh, and listens to your channel often, mm -hmm. if you might consider honoring Dharma's Kirtan band with a little more airtime. You know, one of the first things I learned to say in Hindi was dekenge, which means, we'll see. Is that two questions? Oh, yeah, it was. Okay, good. I'm still avoiding them. Good. Keep going. Uh, somebody over here? There. Okay, good. Hi. Hey, KD. Thanks hey. for coming. Yeah. Um, I've heard you talk about there not being a divide or a barrier between the spiritual life. 
uh-huh. and everyday life. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you build up strength to bring those together? They were always together. There's not two lives. Are you like, do you roll out of bed on both sides in the morning? <laughs> what, what, what? There's only your life. And everything's a part of it, you know. You, there's nowhere to go where you're not, where you're not going to be. And there's nothing that you're going to be doing that somebody else is doing. You're doing everything. So it's just all you need to add to it, all we need to add to our lives is a little paying a little attention to ourselves and why we do what we do and keep trying to clean up our act. That's all. It's not... There's, there's not two things going on. There's only you and your life. And your desires are beautiful. They will never give you what you really want, but that doesn't mean you need to try to kill them. Pretend they're not there. That's what they do. You know, that's not a good, uh, a good uh, idea, as we know from all the, the problems with the priests and, and all the different organized religions, the problem that they never deal with the sexual energy, they wind up being destroyed by it. So it's just a question of being alive and being true to yourself and learning how to do that, finding out who you are and what you want. That's spiritual. There's no worldly or spiritual as far as I'm concerned. You know. And Maharaji was totally in the world. He was totally available all the time. And yet he was also totally present all the time. He never... Everything was within that, you know? So it's, it's not like it's, nothing's ultimately all good or all bad. It's always a mixture of stuff. The point is, Buddha was very clear about this when he came out of the jungle. He said, oh, monks, shit don't work. <laughs> stuff does not work. Happiness will never come from stuff. There's always some dissatisfaction with, with, with objects. They never give us what we think they will give us, what we hope they will give us. You can't squeeze water from a stone. It's not meant to happen. But if you keep trying to do it, you suffer. So once you give up that activity that causes suffering, then there's no suffering. If you don't expect, when you sit down to a big meal, you eat, you eat, you eat, you understand without saying that tomorrow you'll probably have to eat again. Probably every day you'll need to eat again. That doesn't bother you because you don't think ultimate, final satisfaction will come from that meal. You know, it, and that's the way it is with desire. It always has to be one more, 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 more. Ultimately, we recognize how to live with that by seeing it clearly for what it is. At some point, you might decide to take some time off from your desires and see how that works. Usually, it doesn't work very well. But it's useful to, to play with that and see how you are. But then you, can, you, have to, you, know, you have to look at yourself. Is it because I'm afraid? Am I afraid of my desires? And if I am, why am I afraid? What's, what's, what is it? What is that fear? You know, you, can, you have to see yourself. You can't. It's, it's up to each one of us to move through those places. It takes tremendous courage. It really does. There's no two ways about that. It really takes courage to face ourselves and the incredible level of bullshit that we tell ourselves all day long. It's very, very, very fierce. One time I was in uh, Mumbai with Maharaji. We had trailed him. We had a long story, but we found them in, in, in Mumbai. And so we were in this, every day we'd go to this Parsi apartment building, this beautiful new building, and he was hanging out there. It was the son of a devotee. So one day I was sitting, he was up on the bed, lying down, and I'm sitting doing my spiritual practice, which was... He would sit this way, then he would sit up, then he would lie down this way, and I would go, huh? Uh-huh. 
And then all of a sudden, he, after hours, he sits up like this, and he looks at me and he goes, courage is a really big thing. What's going to happen? So the Indian guy there said, oh, but Baba, God takes care of his devotees. Maharaj just shot him a look that would have killed, a, 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 could have destroyed a tank or something like that. And he said to me, courage is a really big thing. Then he laid down and went to sleep again. There have been times in my life that I just had this very vague memory of those words. And it was enough to save me from falling off a cliff or jumping off a cliff. It takes tremendous courage to really look at ourselves and, and see how conflicted we are about letting ourselves be happy. How hard it is to overcome the programs and all the betrayals and all the broken hearts. It's really hard. Well, what else are we going to do? Eventually you just say, all right, I'm going to deal with this. And you try to find a way to be more kind to ourselves. Buddha said that you could search the whole universe and never find a being more worthy of kindness and caring than yourself. So, is that how we feel about ourselves? I don't know. Only each one of us has the answer to that question. So the chanting is a, a way of letting go of the programs for, for a little while and planting seeds of something else in our being. So like I said with Ramakrishna, I didn't really feel finish that whole thing. So the seeds of the repetition of the name start growing at some point when the causes and conditions are good. And then they destroy that house. And he said that house is who we think we are, right? So when we, we're no longer thinking that, that, so a house is a temporary structure. And it's built for a reason. And when the, the walls and the roof are gone, the space that was inside the house is just becomes the space that was outside the house. The division is gone. The difference between me and you and me and all the other me's that bounce off each other all life long, that's gone. And you live in the oneness of it all. You can still see other people and you can see, and you can re react and act with them and interact with them, but you know yourself to be the, the, the living inner presence of all beings. You don't lose anything by not believing you're, you're who you think you are anymore. You gain everything. So, And you notice what Ramakrishna didn't say. He didn't say it'll feel like this or it'll feel like that and then you'll have this and that because it isn't about that. People ask me, what do I experience when I sing? And I, I say, well, how do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I sing and anything that comes up, I let go and I sing. I don't write it down, oh, then he thought about this. <laughs> Why would I? That's not the deal. The deal is to sing 100%, as much as my usual, at least 100% of my usual 3%. <laughs> I'm not into I have no idea what happens. I sing. That's it. Next, then I go home. But if, you, if you're doing spiritual practice and you're like evaluating the whole way down, yeah, this is a really good meditation. This is fantastic. <laughs> Oh, I haven't had a thought in maybe four seconds. This is extraordinary. Oh, wait a second. That was a thought, wasn't it? Wow, that's amazing. There's no way out of this, is there? Ah! Let go, come back to the breath. That's all you have to do. It's not about like, how do I feel now? That's more bullshit. Who cares how you feel? I don't care. And when you don't care, you'll be happy. That's the funny thing. When you don't think about yourself, you're ridiculously happy. When I was going to kill myself, you know, I was going to, there's a river out behind the temple and I was going to jump in the river. It was only six inches deep. 
Well, I figured I could get my head under a rock, maybe, you know. So Maharaji called me and said, what are you going to do, jump in the river? Ha <laughs> ha! He's not taking this very seriously. He said, you can't die. You can't die. Worldly people don't die. Only Jesus died the real death. What the fuck is he talking about? Why did, why did he die? Why did he die? Because he never thought of himself. That being, there was no planet of me in that being for the thoughts of me, me, me to, re to re uh, revolve around, orbit around. That being was liberated. There was no me left. Like any true saint, there's no me there. There's only presence. Being, bliss, happiness, a sense of well-being. And even in the face of, of suffering, that well-being, that core of okayness is not lost. It's not lost. So. So plant the seeds of the things you want to grow. Period. That's it. Plant the seeds of, the, of what you want to grow. If you pl keep planting selfishness and, and shame and fear and greed and anger and all that stuff, that's what's going to grow. We do that. We can't stop. So we have to plant, when we can, plant the seeds of the good stuff that we want to have in our lives. And it'll make a little less room for the weeds as time goes on. Nobody can do it except us. That's the good news and the bad news. Hi, Krishna. <laughs> hey, hey. Hi. It's okay. I got you. I often hear people. Um, Hold the mic a little closer. I often hear people thank you for singing. Yeah. And I often hear you answer, "You sing to save your ass." Yeah. So I just wanted to thank you for saving your ass. You're welcome. <laughs> That's it. Just a statement. Okay. Yeah, my ass got a lot bigger over the years. <laughs> kind of includes everybody now. Pain in the ass. Thank you. You know, yeah, okay. Yeah. This guy had his hand up. That person, not a guy. That woman had her hand up a long time. Hi. Hi. Is that too loud? Not for me. I'm deaf. All right. Okay, thanks. Oh, <laughs> welcome to the club. Thank you. Uh, you started out by talking about how to get to the point of where we're trying to get to the point of where everything's okay. Yeah. And um, where you recognize everything's okay. It's not about a point where you make everything okay. Oh, that's pretty good. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, that was it. No, but okay. that's close to the answer. I think yeah. what I was going to ask you was how do, do you have any thoughts about integrating that thought? Along with what, like for me personally in the world now, anger, which a lot of people I think don't like or want to have anger, but oh, yeah. I kind of, I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it doesn't feel bad, mm -hmm. but a lot of people around me say, oh no, that's bad, that's unhealthy, that's toxic. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you ever have anger. Oh and no. <laughs> I, <laughs> Today, I called His Holiness the Dalai Lama a dipshit. Because you see, when I drive, I imagine that all the other drivers are the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so when somebody cuts me off, I say, fine, Your Holiness, please take the... You, you know, why would I not let the Dalai Lama cut me off? First, and then, you know, somebody else 
you know, tailgating me too tight. It's the Dalai Lama. It's fine. He can do that. So today, his holiness cut me off. I said, dipshit. And then I said, oh, Jesus, I just called the Dalai Lama a dipshit. Well, I don't know. It depends. You know, anger, anger is anger. You know, uh, it can be very destructive, very self-destructive. And a lot of it comes from blaming other people for being stupid and hurting us and being not who we want them to be or how we'd like them to be or life not being the way quite we'd like it to be. So it's not a, an emotion that's going to create a lot of beauty and love in your life. Uh, it can be useful in some times, you know, and it's always good to deal with what's there and not to imagine it's not there and try to transmute it into love for all beings, you know. That won't work. But to look at why you're angry and what you're really angry at and also see the results of your anger. Uh, maybe your friends stop calling you because, you know, they don't want to get hit with it even if it's not aimed at them, for instance. So, you know, is that what you want? No. So just bring some awareness and, and breathe with it, you know, breathe with it. Listen to your life. And that's one thing we should all do. We should listen to our lives. And our, is our life the way we want it to be? And if it isn't, what, how can we, how can we help our lives become a place we want to really live and be in, and in a good way. You know? we got to do it. Nobody can do it for you. Thanks. Okay. Somebody? going to sing, don't worry. As soon as that woman leaves. Yes. Yes. Sir. Every morning I uh, met in the place that I go by five cats, seven peacocks, several hogs, several other animals, and they all have expectation that they'll be fed. Mm -hmm. I try to temper my expectation. What do you say to that? Should I or should I expect what they always expect? Not necessarily to be fed kibble or whatever they mm -hmm. get, meow mix. <clears throat> whatever, but should I always expect that things that I want to have or think about or whatever, is that, is, is not expecting something a way to expect it? You mean, can you fool yourself? Yeah, no. in some ways, or... or yeah, or, we can't, you know, we, we can't really fool ourselves. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to live with the fact that the particular thing you want, you won't get. You know? Like, I wanted to be 6'8", 240 pounds, power forward on the basketball team. <laughs> but I was 6'1", 185, and that guy used to beat the shit out of me. So I'm never going to be 6'8", 240, no matter what I do. I have to live with that. And in fact, you know, in my life, I really wanted to play basketball. And uh, I went to, I had a basketball scholarship to Brandeis. And uh, before my senior year, I ripped up my leg, ligaments in my right leg, and I didn't get into shape in time, and they took the scholarship back. I was destroyed. That was the only thing I wanted. I mean, I was playing music. I loved, you know, I was doing all that, but I was a basketball maniac. And um, I was destroyed by that. I, I, my whole life changed that day that I ripped up my ankle, my leg. It was amazing. And it was very painful. 
So my friend and I were going to build a Harley. Back in the old days in the comic books, you, there was a little ad, you know, build a Harley motorcycle. So we were going to get this kit for like $10, <laughs> build the motorcycle and drive out to, to the West Coast and be lumberjacks. <laughs> and uh, the basketball coach of Stony Brook called me. It was his first year. His name was Herb Brown, Larry Brown's brother. He called me and said, hi, Jeff, what you doing? I said, well, I'm going to go be a lumberjack. He said, oh, don't you want to play ball? Yeah. So I went to Stony Brook, which was great because it turned out to be the drug and music capital of the East Coast. <laughs> I played more games on LSD than any other drug. It was unbelievable. <laughs> the, the coach used to have me come sit next to him in the front of the bus, and he'd put his arm around me, and he'd say, it'll be okay, it'll be okay. And I'd be like, okay, okay, okay. It was amazing. So, you know, you have to live with it, you know. But if you don't allow yourself to feel that terrible disappointment and the pain of not getting what you want, you're never going to move through it to get what you really want. You know, we can't pretend that we don't hurt. All of us hurt. That's the deal. You know, and we, we have to allow that to be in our lives. It's a big part of being human is to allow that, all the different kinds of suffering and pain to allow ourselves to feel that. It makes us human and it bonds us with every other being on the planet because we all suffer. And so it makes you more human, you know. And then you look at other people and you see what they feel. And you can feel that you can relate. And you know what a person's going through. And that makes you compassionate. Without even pretending to be compassionate. You just automatically understand what that person in the street is feeling. And you see somebody yelling at somebody else with terrible anger. And you know what that feels like. Not only to the person they're angry at but what it feels like to be owned by that fierce, passionate anger in your own heart that's burning you alive. It's just part of being human. Yeah. Somewhere? Right there. Yeah, right there. It's good. Oh, you next. You next. Hi, I good. To, yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you a question since you've lived in India. What is the difference between the kirtans and bhajans? Well, you know, bhajan is usually a story, a song about a story. Like something happened in the Ramayana or Krishna's play and this and that. Just like gospel songs. But kirtan is the repetition of the name only. I mean, more or less. You know, it's India, so anything is good, no problem. <laughs> but technically, one thing is one thing and another thing is another thing, you know. but <laughs> yeah. So. Hi. Hello. Hello. My name is Mora. Oh, really? Hi. How are you? Yeah. I saw you uh, the other night. Uh, Rita, I know. We, I got you down. We got We're talking. Down. We've been talking. I just, because you said the other night you and, when you went and played with David, you know, you're just two, two old Jew, Jewish guys playing in a band. And I was curious how, uh, how you feel or felt or where does your Judaism come into play for you? I'm about as Jewish as the Pope. Okay, so there is none. I also, I usually joke, I say I'm Jewish on my parents' side. <laughs> I mean, culturally I'm Jewish. I grew up in that culture to some degree, but, but, but you know, I mean, uh, nobody in my family believed in God. I believe there really is something to find in the world other than fighting over the Pope's nose. 
Anybody know what the Pope's nose is? It's the part of the chicken that goes over the fence last. That's what they, at the table, they would fight over that. You know, it was... You've sat with rabbis, I'm sure. I had, you know, my grandparents were so good to me on both sides. Without them, I would be dead. You know, and I re realized later that every other weekend when I was sent to my grandparents' house, that's when my parents went to therapy. <laughs> you know, so my, I got all that wonderful love and caring and affection from my grandparents. Not that my parents weren't loving, but my grandparents really. So culturally, there was part of, But you know, the other thing, they never talked about the Holocaust. I never heard about it. And all of those people that I grew up with, they had relatives there. They never mentioned so it's interesting. But yeah, you know. And then, of course, my bar mitzvah. I was bar mitzvah, you know. So we had the, the celebration at this place called the Club Jericho on Jericho Turnpike in Long Island. Really fancy. And... By the end of the day, I had like $1,000 in checks in my pocket. People, all my relatives give me, you know. My father comes up to me and says, uh, give me the checks. <laughs> what? Hey, give me the checks. I have to pay for this. That's when Judaism went out the fucking window. Not one minute after that did I ever think I want everything to do with this ever again. I was thinking of all the porn I could buy. I was 13 and I just became a man, so what else you do? No, you know, but later on I came to appreciate it a lot more. I read a bunch of books about the Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov was, a, I believe it was 16th century. He was an incredible saint. And you know what it means? Baal Shem Tov, it means the master of the good name. Hello? Yeah. The name. I don't know, maybe he sang Sri Ram Jai Ram when nobody was looking. <laughs> the name, the name. So uh, he was incredible. So I've come to appreciate a lot of that, mystical. But, you know, you know I'm a one-trick pony. I woke up in India, I went in, I always had a, this is what I do, this is what I am, I got, you know, I can't do anything else except some things. Who? Yeah, what, anybody? Who? Here? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, maybe this is a little bit of a, you know, a for me question, but hopefully other people will appreciate it too. Don't have um, hope. <laughs> um, I just want to acknowledge that we're here in this space, like we had mentioned earlier, we're here at, at Dharma's place, and I've seen you here before over the years, and I'm wondering if maybe you can speak a little bit about your relationship with our teacher, and if you want to share a story, or because I don't really know much about it. Dharma and I have spent very little time together physically, really. We love each other very much, but we don't, it's never been, we've never had a lot of time to spend together. Uh, uh, he would invite me to come sing to the teacher trainees at the old place, and I would love to do that. It's just kind of, we kind of know each other and love each other, but there's, we just haven't spent a lot of physical time together. Um, and all, of course, all the yoga teachers that I know, the, the, the older generation, they, they all used to come to Dharma for teaching. You know, they all learned so much from him. He's not just a yoga teacher, he's a yogi. There's a difference. And uh, he's a wonderful being. Yeah. Good, good being. It's really not easy to be that. You have to really be that to be that. Okay, more? Or we, we sing a little bit? Okay, yeah, good. No, no. This is imp I don't care if you don't like it. It's important to me.
I go all around the world, and I do this with people all around the world, and I want to tell you, they ask, it's the same thing every time. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody has the same issues, the same problems, slightly different way of... Uh, the only place, two places. Once, the first time I did a workshop in, in, in uh, Zurich, they sat there like this for three hours. <laughs> when the gong rang in three hours, they rushed me, and they all had questions. I said, what's been, what, for three hours, what have you been doing? The other time was in Norway, okay? So we had a very, time, everybody was, we had great singing, everybody was talking. There was one guy sitting like where you're sitting, like this, the whole time. Like. <laughs> he didn't move for three hours. And I thought, this guy is a serial killer. <laughs> What am I going to do with this? i I got to get out of here the minute I stop. So I tried to get out, but everybody rushed the stage. They were waiting in line to talk to me, and I saw he was, like, in the line. And so I was, like, smiling. Hi, yeah, how the first one? Yeah, but, oh, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Good, and thank you. Oh, next one, thank you. And then all of a sudden he's there, and he goes, This was great! All the sweat that I sweated for the first three hours was ridiculous. The guy, it was just like, he was scary looking, though. <laughs> this is why, you know, we live in our own worlds, you know. We're projecting all the time on everybody else, you know. I don't know who any of you are, a couple of you, I might have some ideas. But basically, when I see you, you know, you're playing your part in my dream. So I'm really playing your part in my world. Isn't it incredible? So when we talk like this, we kind of bring the inside out and everybody can share so much of the same stuff, that we're in the, all in the same place. We all want the same thing and we have all the same issues. So I think this is great. But, and you came, so screw it, you're done. <laughs> Where was it? Over there. Yeah, hi. Hi, I have a, a practical question and a... You're asking me practical something? I probably should have just emailed somebody, but it was exciting somebody else, to... Somebody yeah, good luck. Get to ask you directly, um, and then I have a spiritual question if I get two for one. I'll see if I can tell the difference. <laughs> I sing with um, a few people in Knoxville, Tennessee, and it's mostly bhajans for Amrita, uh, Amachi, Ma Amachi, the hugging saint, sure. and, and some Sai Baba bhajans, but um, I've been doing some Krishna Das songs in the mix, and I always feel really guilty, because I always think, oh, you know, should I be paying somebody some royalties, oh, or yeah. like if we perform? <laughs> 50 cents a mantra. Does it matter if it's donation? Does it matter if there's a fee? No, no, come on. It's, it's, it's all free. You just, when you buy a CD, you, 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 uh, you know, then I can pay my rent. Other than that, there's nothing you have to do. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Yeah. The, um, they don't punish you for singing my stuff in there? Everybody told me not to worry about it, but I got a, oh. I got a guilty conscience. Okay. <laughs> I used to sing a lot for Almachi here in, in New York when she came by. But I came once and... There was a battle going on for stage time. There were like, a lot of people wanted to sing, and they were like fighting with each other. About, I just took my harmonium and went home. I just said, this is, I, I, I'm not, fine, let them have it. What do I care? It's crazy. The harmonium, the, the Kirtanwala Wars, I call it. <laughs> One in World War II, Kirtanwala War II. Okay, go ahead. Now your spiritual question. This is going to be great. It's, it was probably pretty standard. Um, <laughs> you tell a great story about um, willpower and mm. when you learned about the need and purpose of it. Sure. And, um, and I get that. And then there's also an element to life about surrender. And, and I feel like I get that as well. And what I have trouble with is... Um, when to do which and the balance between the two? Well, it's not quite like that, at least as far as I can see. Surrender, real surrender, means dropping the separate self, the sense of a separate self. 
the sense, the belief that you're you and not that you're that you are actually who you think you are. So that's surrender, being able to drop that and merge into the oneness. And without willpower, there's not the slightest possibility in hell that that will ever happen. You just don't drop it. You have to transmute it. You have to let it go. You have to give it away. You have to move it over. You have to look, see through it. You have to analyze it. You have to understand it. You have to see your motivations. You have to be good to people. You have to care about yourself and others. It's really, it's the whole path. Surrender is the goal. It doesn't mean giving up your will to somebody else. It means dropping your separate self and merging with the whole universe. Dropping it. Just letting it go. You think you can do that without willpower? No possibility. But we don't use, we don't even use our will well. You know. She's referring to a story I told, what happened to me once I was in the jungle with this very, very old yogi. He was 163 years old. This was back in the 80s. He's still alive, I hear. I haven't seen him for many years. So we were sitting together, and he looked at me, and he goes, ah. He said, you have to develop. He said in Hindi, he said, Icha shakti, Icha shakti. Icha is desire, shakti is power. Icha shakti means willpower or the power to get what you want. And my thought was like, what do I need that for? And then he went like, oh. And then he did something. He saw my, he could, he could read your thoughts. It was ridiculous. So. so then he did something inside of me. He showed me, inside of me, what he saw. And I went, oh. <laughs> I didn't see that. And I saw myself. I was doing nothing. Nothing. I was floating. I wasn't doing anything to help myself be happy even. I was just, I wasn't doing anything. It was a really dark time in my life. It was in the 80s. Um, and I saw that I had chains around my, my own ankles. And I wouldn't let myself go after the things I wanted in life. For so many stupid reasons. You know, oh, I might not get it. What do they think if I like this? You know, all that stuff. It was amazing what he showed me. And from that moment, it was life-changing in many ways. And it kind of led, it was one step on the, on the, on the, the path of getting a, becoming, starting to sing with people. It was one move in the right direction. Our wills are really compromised by all the conflicting emotions that we have and all the conflicting desires and all the, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves that we don't like. So we don't, when, even when we use our will or our strength to go after something, the motivation for going after that particular thing is very confused very confused, and it really doesn't ever give us what we want, what we really want. And then I saw, wherever that was, over there somewhere, I saw that there, was, there wasn't worldly life and spiritual life. There was just me and my life. And I was crippling myself in my, my daily life, my so-called worldly life, the life of my desires. How was I going to do something in the so-called spiritual realm, but with no will, how am I going to calm my mind? It was the same will. There's not two of me. There's one of me. And if I wasn't doing over here, it wasn't going to work over there. So it was very interesting. I had to start paying attention to myself in a different way. And, you know, uh, I think one has to find out that what one wants isn't what really one wants, to some degree. And you have to live. You have to go for it. Even if it winds up that you just bash your head against the wall again at 100 miles an hour. Because there's no other way to learn. There's no other way to find out what you want 
other than getting what you thought you want and finding out it wasn't enough or that it doesn't last or it's not really what you want. It's experiential. You can't do it in your head. Maharaji sent me, after two and a half years, he looked at me one day out of the blues, as far as I was concerned, and said, okay, go back to New York. You have attachment there. What? What are you talking about? I was, in, I was coming, forever I was going to live in India, you know? I had no plan to go back in my head. And now all of a sudden I'm going back. He said, you have attachment there. I didn't know what he was talking about. Hello, how are you, Mr. Attachment? You know, this is everything that happened to me from that moment to this moment is what he was talking about. I could not work through my stuff in India in the way I was living in India at that time. And also, like, he was getting ready to leave as well. So that would have been very difficult to be there. So he was telling me I had to come back to America and deal with my stuff. It's the only way to become free is to deal with it. There's no fast track around it. It just doesn't work that way. We misinterpret a lot of those things that we... Oh, hello. Where were we? Here. Hmm? Will. power. Going back to New York to deal with you. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he sent me back. I would have, first of all, I was so sick. I had every disease you could get. I had hepatitis, all kinds of parasites, every kind, everything. I wouldn't have lasted long in India. And, uh, but there was no possibility of me working through my stuff in India. It just wasn't going to happen. So he sent me back. And uh, I guess I'm OK with it. Eventually, I'll probably get with the program. You know, he knew what was best for me. And he knows what's best for me. And uh, I try to listen to my own heart because that's how he speaks to me. He didn't tell me to go back to America and sing with people. He, didn't, he never told me to do that. I had to recognize that this is what I needed to do for me. And this is what's happened. You know, I didn't plan this. It just happened. So it must be okay. But willpower is a very interesting thing. One can use it for so many different reasons. But if uh, it's the ability to keep yourself moving in the direction you want to move, ultimately.
Yeah. We haven't heard from this side of the room for a while. Anybody over here? Where's somebody here? Okay, who has the mic? Usually I let the one with the mic pick because you have to give him five rupees and he gives you the mic. Just, but go ahead. You have something to say? Say. So you were, you were saying... Um, Now my question is gone. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, it's back. Okay, so. <laughs> problem. Uh, what if in your life you um, you look, uh, listen to your heart, and you don't get the direction for your life, like you say? Mm-hmm. More, you just want to meditate and be in the silence mm-hmm. and you don't you, you know I'm, I'm going to work but it's just so I can pay my bills and for a while now I don't have any motivation to go after anything in life mm-hmm. and I wonder is that wrong from what you're saying because the only thing I want to do is be in the silence it's not for me to say it's wrong or right. You know, this is it's your life. You, only you know, and only you can work through it, find, find out what's right for you. But I will say that um, there is a lot of confusion about states of mind. Mm. And when you say you want to stay in the silence, in the real silence, there's no you. Mm-hmm. So I hear that you seem to want to hold on to one particular type of feeling as opposed to other types mm-hmm. of feeling. That's not, a, uh, uh, that's not going to work yeah. because you're pushing things away. Ultimately, the silence is everywhere all the time because it is that way. Yeah. And nothing can disturb it. Yeah. So any state of mind you try to hold on to will not last. States of mind are all temporary. Yeah. The only thing that's non-temporary is who you are, which is not a state of mind. It's pure being, pure ultimate reality. That's who's in there. That's what's in there. So it's no different than wanting uh, dessert without eating your meal, you know? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) So if you try to, if you're pushing anything away, it's not, it's not a, a, uh, a, uh, it's not something that's going to ultimately give you what you want. So that's all I have to say about that. Okay. Thank you. People think you know we 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 hear about samadhi and all this meditation stuff. You know, it's very subtle stuff, really. It's not so easy. I mean, don't think you're going to sit down and. Meditate yourself into some other planet. You know, it doesn't work that way. And and I remember we used to, a lot of times we'd see Maharaji in the late afternoon when the temple gates had closed and just the people in the temple were there. So I used to put on my holy clothes and go out and sit down. And one day I was sitting there and I almost burst out laughing because as I was sitting there I saw that my idea of enlightenment, nirvana, was some place that I would not be. <laughs> and where was that going to be? Where is the place that you're not going to be? You're here now. When you go to the bathroom, you're going to be there too. Tonight, you go to sleep. Where are you going to be? Right there. There's nowhere you can go where you will not be. And nirvana is not some other place. Liberation is not some other place where you won't be. It's actually where you're going to finally fully be present when you stop hating yourself and limiting ourselves. So that was interesting. (laughs) Yeah.
Good evening. Hi. Um, in this process of um, um, serving, feeding, and remembering, um, what is what is your understanding of the role of uh, children and uh, own children uh, or children in general? Your own children or other people's children? What do you, I'm not sure what you mean. Both. Your own children, having own children, is this important part of this or how does this fit into this? It's one of those things that happen <laughs> when you do certain things. Heard about it? Yeah. You were a child, we were all children once, you know. And our parents, whether they were... Uh, whatever part of the scale they were on, we're still here. They took care of us enough, and at least cared enough that we're still here. And you know when you're a baby, there's nothing you can do for yourself. And, you know, India has a very strange way of looking at things. There's a, an incredible hymn by Shankar Charya. And I, I recorded part of it on the f my first CD. It's called the Devya Aparadakshama Panastotra. How do you like that? <laughs> and it translates as begging the goddess for forgiveness. And the line that's repeated, verse after verse, is uh, in the whole... Let me see. I want to... Basically, he keeps on saying that there will never be a bad mother, even though I'm such a bad child, and begs the goddess for forgiveness. And the idea is simply, we don't even, un we, we don't, we barely know we're alive on a day-to-day -day basis. We float through our lives in a sleep. We don't understand how hard it is to be, get a human body and to be in a position to satisfy our desires and live a good life. And especially in this circumstance, we're all, there are many places in the world where you, you can't rest for a second, where you have, you're on the road, you're being driven by this or driven by that, bombs are falling, poverty. A human body, and, and in a good circumstance, is very difficult, to, they say, to get. But we don't appreciate it. And we would not be here if our parents, regardless of their own problems, didn't take care of us enough to stay, keep us alive. It's very interesting. I mean, I have all kinds of issues with my parents, right? But still, they fed me. They took care of me. They allowed me to live on this earth and to live and to manifest whatever karmas I had to work with. And now here I am, learning to sing and chant the name and try to find a good way to live. Without them, I wouldn't be here. And it's the same with our own children. You know, uh, We just do the best we can. Um, we just try to, regardless of our own shortcomings, we, we try to let our children know that we love them. And that's not so easy sometimes. I don't know. More? Anything else? I'm sure I didn't answer your question, but <laughs> you're, you're right to give up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How are we doing? Anybody else? Oh, over there in the dark, I can see a few people. So we'll go. We'll take a few more questions, and and then we'll sing. If that's okay. <laughs> He's very dramatic. <laughs> um, hi. Hi. So you were saying earlier that we should be thinking about other people, we should be serving people and helping them out. I don't think I said should. Okay. 
That's one of the words I try to avoid, especially when I'm talking to myself. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so what, what was the word you used? I'm sorry. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. What's uh, your question? So uh, how do we help people or how do we think about them without we ourselves getting, you know, fatigued by it? In the, like either in our work life, in our family life, or, you know, all the phases of life. So how do we think about other people? Yeah, like how do we help them and not get fatigued by it? Well, one of the ways you help other people is uh, recognizing uh, your own projections onto them and, and not doing that to other people. Like say there's somebody at work who never looks at you, never talks to you, seems to avoid you everywhere, you know. And you build up a story about that person in your own mind. And then you find out he's got brain cancer. And, and that the fact that he never spoke to you has nothing to do with you. He's totally absorbed in his own shit. So that's one thing we can do to help other people is not believe our own stories about them unconsciously. And then as far as uh, you do what you can to help people, it's not a question of trying to change anybody. The best way to help people is to work on yourself and allow some compassion towards yourself to also extend outward to other beings and not be so harsh on yourself or others. Um, and more than that, I mean, if there's some other ways that you can help, you try to find a way to help, you know. I mean, this, I remember being completely blown away. I, I heard, read about this woman down in Texas somewhere who just decided she recognized how much food was wasted at the supermarkets, you know. That after a certain time, they have to throw everything out. She created a business of collecting all that food and feeding homeless people and people who needed it. It was amazing. I mean, she fed like hundreds of thousands of people a week. And I thought, God damn it, I wish I could do that. But it's not me. You know, I, I this, you know? So you find your way of doing it. It's just everything is good. You know, anything you can do for anybody is a good thing. But once again, it's not done out of a sense of, uh, I'm going to help this person, you know, how great I am. I can, I'm going to give, you know, get over it, you know. You just do what you can in a very simple, easy way. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't give, you know. There's so much fear about contacting other people and, and opening up and allowing the reality of this world to enter into our hearts. It's... It can be very brutal. There's no question about it. That's why you need inner strength. That's why you need to, we need to get new mufflers for everybody on the fucking street. <laughs> now there's something to do. So that's why when we, when we have inner strength, when we trust our own hearts, when we learn to take it easy on ourselves, then we can just do what comes naturally. Helping people will come naturally once we overcome our own fears and stuff like that. You just do what you do. You know, our own karmas allow us to do certain things and not to do other things. Sometimes you have to feed yourself first before you can take it help another person. Sometimes you have enough, you can just give. It's just a way of overcoming selfishness and self-centeredness and the obsession with me, me, me. It's a good practice to help with that. I'm sure that didn't satisfy you, but I did the best I could. Okay, anybody over here? Okay, here. One, two. Huh? 
Okay, three. That's it. Yeah, okay, you're two. Hi, Kitty. Hi. Um, actually, every question answered so many thoughts I have in my mind. Uh, about what like men, about the spirit in chanting, how did a major role in my transformation. And especially to this mantra, the Divine Mother, Madurga. Can you explain a little bit about that? Which one? Madurga. Yeah. Durga. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's unbelievable what I feel when I chant that. Yeah. It's that sort of divine connection. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Why do you want me to screw it up for you? <laughs> 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 Sounds like you're you doing share. just... You're doing just fine, you know. Don't ask me to ruin it. it the experience of the name is your experience. That's, you don't need to think about it. Just move into it more fully, always, every time. This, you don't need this. It's useless. There. Huh? Where? Good, him and then and then in the back. And then we'll sing. Oh, okay, back there. Hello. Hi. Thank you. I've uh, really enjoyed listening to you last night and also especially today with this format. So Good. I'm glad you like it too. There's two of us then. There's two of us. <laughs> um, you know, you were just talking about the selfishness in the me. I've been in recovery for the past two decades. And I've found myself here and I've really you know, heard a lot of what you said today has really resonated with me, and I, I believe you have a past with addiction, and I was wondering what your feelings are about that, and about a path with a past, past, past addiction of, with oh, yeah. addiction, and what your thoughts and feelings are on addiction. Well, <clears throat> it just doesn't work. <laughs> Bottom line, you know. Good luck with your addiction, but it doesn't work. So I'm not a fan of anything that doesn't work. And um, I, I've told many times how I was uh, strung out on free base cocaine for a couple of years. And so people think I'm an expert on addiction. I mean, no offense, but I don't know anything about it. I was saved, literally, by my Indian father and Maharaji. They just saved me. I, I'd flown in from California. Okay, Mr. Tiwari was coming from India to visit now, I was very close with this family for many years, and I was actually treated like the eldest son in this family. And I, I really treasured that. And uh, so Mr. Tuari came to America to visit with the devotees. He flew to Canada first. I was living in California. And uh, I was very addicted to free base cocaine. And uh, I flew into New York, and I had enough to smoke for one night. And I was up all night smoking, and then I ran out, and I was scrounging around the floor. I was smoking lint from socks, anything that looked like anything to smoke. I was smoking it. And then I flew to Canada the next day, and I drove out to the place a couple of hours outside of Montreal where he was visiting. And I walked into the room where he was sitting. He had his back to the door. He was talking to another friend of mine. And I walked into the room. As I walked into the room, I felt this, I don't know what to, it's like a force field. And I, I stopped. And I was just about to kind of back away, get away from, I didn't even know, I wasn't thinking. I was just like, and he turned. And he looked at me and said, you! Promise me now you will give up cocaine. Promise me now. Like that. I said, okay. 
And that was it. From that moment to this moment, gone from my consciousness. And I just want to tell you, if it had been up to me, there was no way. I was gone. I was on my way out. I could not deal with that. I could not get sober myself. You. And I couldn't say no to him. I mean, it wasn't an option. I, I, would, I would do anything he ever asked me to do. And so I just said, okay. And that was it. I don't know. I guess they wanted the kid to live. Otherwise, so, uh, but I was, I, I'm, I had just a black hole in my heart. And this is after being with Maharaji, you understand? After my time in India, this is in the 80s. I was still ridiculous, completely in the sugar. The sugar? Got it? That's what I got out of. So uh, they took it away from me. They just took it away. I, I, there's no way I could have ever let go of that. So I have tremendous respect for anyone who's dealing with those issues because I know I couldn't have. And I know how hard it is. And I also know what's at stake and how difficult it is. So, that's it. And how much it's worth to be in the battle, by the way. And how much, what that means to cherish oneself enough to enter into battle with one's own darkness and one's own hungers. Because after all, it's a desire for bliss. It's a desire to be free of suffering. But it doesn't work. That's what I mean by that. It doesn't free us from suffering. It creates more and more and more. So there's nothing wrong with the desire. It's a good desire to be free. But we're not actually, we're putting ourselves in bondage, which is just one of the ways that we get fooled by our own stuff. When we look outside of ourselves for something that can give us that, what we want. Okay, so, you, back there please. And we're gonna sing. Where is she? She left already? Hi, we're gonna, yeah, no, no, we'll be there in a second, but I mean the woman who asked to sing two hours ago. <laughs> she went home to listen to me on CD. You can't please everybody. What are you going to do? <laughs> Hi, Krishna Das. Whoa. Hello there. Very good. Trying to wake everyone. Okay. Thank you. Um, Work in, me up too. In recent times, uh, how have you been spending your time when you visit India? Well, I go up to the mountains and visit the people that I, you know, used, knew for all these years, you know, wander around here and there. I've been hanging out in the jungle with a nice baba sometimes. And also, I've been singing in India, you know. I get so many emails from Indian people, you know, so sweet, you know. I'm your devotee, you are my guru, please come sing, I want to see you, you know. <laughs> Delete. You know, I mean, I can't, I, I'm, you know, I'm not for ready. So, but I do go. So I said to Sydney Ma, I said, Ma, you know, she was always telling me to rest, take care of myself, get enough rest, don't sing too much, don't travel too much. So once I said to Ma, you know, I'm getting all these emails from India, you know, they want me to come sing, you know, should I accept? And I figured she said, no, no, stay home. I said, should I accept? She said, you must. <laughs> Why did I ask? So I'm screwed. Now I have to go and sing. Any other questions? And then I go from pharmacy to pharmacy and get all the, the medicine I need to get over the dysentery and the malaria and everything else, you know. I love it very much. Yes, where are we? Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Then we're going to sing, okay? No? Okay. Got it. Hi. Hello. Some of the Vedanta yoga teachings... Say what? The Vedanta yoga teachings, some of them um, teach that everything in your life is already, already destined and to happen. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Really? Uh, what a concept. Because well, you were talking about free will, and I'm just wondering how that Vedanta teaching... Talking about what? What was that? Will. About? Will, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I mean, I've, I've, had, I've heard people say, some Vedanta yoga teachers, that it's like your life is a film that's already been filmed, and that your choice in your free will is how you respond to suffering or not suffering. But I was just curious to ask you your perspective on that. Um, people say all kinds of shit, you know. <laughs> all I can tell you is Maharaji never spoke about that stuff. He said, serve people, feed people, and remember God. If that talks to you, if that makes sense to you, fine. If it doesn't, fine. Yeah, everybody's selling something. You know, what are you going to do? You're looking for a, a button to push to relieve you of the job of living your life, making your decisions. You're looking for a way to make it okay. Uh, you're looking for a concept to lay on your life that makes sense. I don't think there is one. We'll give her the mic. Where's the mic? This, finally, we're getting into it here. Oh, it's too late? The mic's away? Okay, let me, I, okay. Some people say things like that, but the point is that those kind of, those kind of statements, they're very difficult to understand. One thing is, there's ultimate reality, okay, they say, which is ultimately the, the final, this is the way things are. And then there's relative reality, which is our worlds. So the two things Ultimate reality includes our reality, but relative reality, which is the way we live, all the stories, all, everything we see, it's all relational. That's included in relative, but relative reality doesn't include, doesn't include ultimate truth. It's all relative. It's all subjective stories and our version of stuff. In relative reality, you just do the best you can. Ultimately, nothing ever happened, nothing ever will. There is no one, and, and there never will be anyone. No one's separate from anybody else. It's all one, all the time, and always has been. Nothing ever happened. Obviously, when you stub your toe, that makes no sense. It hurts. So you have to find a way to deal with that pain. You have to learn not to stub your toe. Pay more attention. Up-leveling it intellectually is not useful, as far as I'm concerned. I think it leads to, uh, I think it's based on a fear of engaging with life for most of us. Not that it's not ultimately true, but here, now, we have to get in the battle of life and go after what we want and find out what we want. There's no escape from that because, because every day we're, we're going on and on in one way or another. And if we're not paying attention, we're not paying attention. If we're not living in a way that satisfies us, how is that going to change unless we pay attention and notice it and understand it and find out why? So yeah. Willpower doesn't necessarily change the storyline because you don't know what the storyline is. The storyline might be, yeah, on June 10th, 2019, you decided to go this way. Well, that could have been the story. You just don't know. You can't, you know. One time uh, I was sitting with Maharaji, and uh, I was with uh, one of my guru brothers. He had this book called the Ashtavakra Gita, 
which is the ultimate non-dual teaching book. I mean, it's like there never was anything, ever it's all one, there's never, blah, 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 on like that. So Maharaji sees the book, he said, what's that book? So he showed him, he said, oh, what does it say in there? And the guy goes, says it's all one, which Maharaji always said. Maharaji goes, he looked at the Indian people and said, these boys know everything. <laughs> <laughs> You have to be it. You don't, you don't need to hold on to it. You don't need to understand it. You have to manifest it. One must manifest it in one's heart. And the only way to do that is to engage in some training, which is to keep coming back, letting go and coming back, letting go and coming back. As far as I can see, that's the way you get the strength to let go. And you keep letting go until there's no more letting go and no one to let go anymore. And then it's a different ball game. So let's practice letting go.
Yeah.